What's up, party people, and welcome back to another episode of NYC Foodways, your weekly food and culture discussion from the cultural capital of the world. My name is John, and this week's episode is dedicated to actor Dennis Hopper, who made it cool to be a wild-eyed, sober obsessive. This week on NYC Foodways, we turn the page to Roz Chast's 2014 memoir, Can't We Talk About Something More Pleasant? Chast, despite her many years living in the comparative wilds of suburban Connecticut, is pretty much the ultimate New Yorker and someone I admire to no end. I've had the pleasure of seeing her speak in person on multiple occasions, and she is exactly as smart, funny, engaging, and open as her art would lead one to believe. Rosalind Chast, born in 1954 in Brooklyn, got her first New Yorker cartoon, as she describes it, an incredibly weird, incredibly personal illustration of fictional objects, published in 1978. Over her more than four decades, yes, that is more than four decades of work at our fair city's preeminent literary magazine, Chast has honed her style to a scalpel's edge. Her work is instantly recognizable both in style and substance. It's also recognizable, at least to one fellow Jewish New Yorker, on an almost mitochondrial level. More than once when reading Can't We Talk About Something More Pleasant, I wondered aloud if Chast and I were related, as her experiences so closely mirrored those of members of my own family. Judging by the absolute cavalcade of awards, prizes, fellowships, and positive reviews this book has received, Chast is either related to tens of thousands of her readers or, more likely, that the most personal is indeed the most general, that one really should write what one knows, and that our trauma is our prerequisite for growth. It all starts, of course, with pain. Chast's life and the lives of her parents seems to have had more of the stuff than normal, or perhaps she's just more open and honest about her family's pain than the rest of us are. There are tales of late-stage miscarriages, of hard-scrabble immigration, of pogroms and cholera epidemics, even of murder. Can't We Talk About Something More Pleasant operates on two timelines. One is a fairly linear recounting of Chast's parents' final years. The other is a non-linear retelling of her horribly traumatic childhood. The sins of the parents, to paraphrase the old saying, become the burdens of the child, or in this case, become the basis for one of the most compelling pieces of autobiographical literature I have ever encountered. Emphasis on the graphical part. I had no nostalgia for the carefree days of youth, Chast writes, because I never had them. Yikes. Growing up, her parents, both children of immigrants, had it tough, really tough, and the hard knocks continued after they got married. The concept of looking for something better, Chast writes, of her parents, or being happy, that was for modern people or movie stars, i.e. De <laughs> degenerates. Like most parents, like most people in fact, they lack the tools, awareness, and willpower to properly process their trauma so as to avoid harming their child. This was highly unfortunate for Roz, and highly fortunate for us, her readers, who are let into the pain of her childhood about as deeply as one can be without the use of a time machine. In typical fashion, well, for me at least, there is catharsis in openly sharing in another's pain because, as I see it, all pain is shared, try as we might to keep it to ourselves, as if safeguarding what hurt us could somehow stop it from doing so again, or to stop it from doing so to others. Obviously, the opposite is true. This book is a profound testament to the shared comfort in absorbing another's trauma, honestly expressed, and my repeated readings of it certainly push this channel to be more open in its coverage of topics potentially deemed by outside observers to be too dark. Fear and fears played a major role in Chast's childhood. Her father, extremely anxious by nature, was afraid of many things, including changing light bulbs, climbing step stools, and toasting bread. He bombarded young Rosalind with horrific anecdotes of death by flower pot and by baseball, of death preceded by headache or by rash or by lump. There is a mandala-like wheel of doom depicting the various things that could befall you if you took the wrong action, using mascara, say, or sitting directly on the ground. There is something so perversely wrong about exposing a child to these bullshit tales. Unlike a reasonable adult, who would quickly realize there is no correlation between wearing your watch band too tight and contracting gangrene, children, especially young children, are essentially in a state of hypnosis and will fully believe what is told to them by their adult family members. So is it any wonder that Chast didn't learn to drive until she was 38 and that the dominant theme of her work is anxiety? Her parents, descendants of people who had to live in fear as a survival technique in the old country, were too stubborn, close-minded and short-sighted to change the path of that fear, 
and took no steps to ensure Chast was safe from fears that were obviously unfounded. Chast's mother, the antagonist of the book, if graphic memoirs can have an antagonist, seems afraid of only one thing, losing control of those around her. A short-tempered, domineering control freak, she kept her husband and daughter in thrall and held them permanently hostage to her emotions. She even had a nickname for her not infrequent freakouts, a blast from Chast. What a hoot, screaming at your terrified loved ones because you lacked the self-control needed to express yourself properly. Chast remarks that when she saw Who's Afraid of Virginia Woolf as a teenager, she thought the writer, Edward Albee, must know her parents. This book, like all of Chast's work, packs an enormity into a small space. So did her parents, lifelong renters who, like many people who grew up with very little, or were made to feel like what they had could disappear at any time, were unable to throw anything away. This book is deeply, deeply funny, which is sort of strange, or I guess makes perfect sense for a book of such weighty subject matter. I laughed out loud on multiple occasions. I mean, this book is really, really funny. Chast's art style, unique and immediately recognizable, with tons of detail and heavy use of watercolors, is in perfect form here. This may sound odd, but I find Chast to be a master of backgrounds. Her images tend to be cast against interesting wallpaper, or paint, or vinyl siding, or common household fixtures. It's tough to get it without immersing yourself in it, in vivo, which is why I won't be providing any examples here, but next time you pick up one of her books, take a look. I think you'll see what I'm talking about. It's really easy to be patient and sympathetic, Chast writes, with someone when it's theoretical or only for a little while. It's a lot harder to deal with someone's craziness when it's constant and that person is your dad, the one who's supposed to be taking care of you. And that's the thing, right? Parent-children relationships probably never go the way they're supposed to because the way they're supposed to is an impossible ideal. But anyone mature enough to notice the wrongdoing of their own parents and commit to avoiding repeating it can definitely draw some valuable lessons on parenting styles that should probably be avoided if you don't want your child to carry a two-tongued cross of anxiety, fear, and resentment. A large chunk of this book covers detailed recollection of Chas' parents' slow, then rapid deterioration as they move through their 10th decade of life. Her father's anxiety and passivity, and her mother's demand for complete control at all times made for a hellish childhood for Chast, and an equally, or perhaps worse, experience for her as she, and she alone, becomes responsible for two unbelievably difficult individuals. After a particularly bad fall at the age of 93, Chast's mother was bedridden and in pain, but still so stubborn as to refuse medical treatment. This stubbornness, perhaps her defining characteristic, is the stuff of existential nightmares and will ring true for any viewers of this channel who have family members in dire, obvious need, but who are unwilling to admit it. For some, there is comfort in the adherence to a known falsity over potential discomfort in the embrasure of an unknown truth. I urge everyone watching this to look within and attempt to come to terms with whatever it is they are denying. There are a litany of physical and mental ailments that befall Chast's folks, all of which are diminished or flatly denied by her mother. At one point, enraged, she yells, I do not like to talk about death, and I will not talk about death, as if mere words could halt the march of time. Can you imagine dealing with someone so deep in denial that they, at an extremely advanced age, would seek to deny the existence of death? I hope that anyone who read this book or watches this video is willing to re-examine whatever self-limiting belief systems you hold as ultimately they end up harming your family. So don't be a selfish for once in your life. Does your family matter to you? Seriously, does it? Does it matter enough for you to change your default setting? Or does it matter only enough for you to say it matters? I brought my mother from the place to the hospital to visit him every day, Chast writes about one of her father's hospital stays. I dreaded these excursions. I resented taking care of her. She never asked me anything about how I felt about my father's decline. It was, as it always was, completely about her. Could you imagine someone writing this about you and sharing it with the world? I'm not a parent, but can't we talk about something more pleasant is without a doubt a lesson in parenting, that it is possible to be both a parent and a friend, that your negativity, your anxiety, your poor habits and your self-centeredness will create long-lasting scars in and on your children, and that, if you want to be okay, 
in any appreciable sense of the word outside of completely controlling those around you, or at least attempting to do so, you have to let go. Blessedly, for her readers, and undoubtedly herself, Roz Chast has beautifully, willingly, and publicly let go, in word and image, of what traumatized her most deeply. May this act bring us all a sense of comfort. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you next week for another episode of NYC Foodways. Peace.